What's happening, good people? I am First Things First. Don't forget the coach, then comes Mo. And you're here with the Evening Social Podcast Spotlight on Genefest Worldwide Radio Show. Tonight, I'm with Damon Bethea. DB, my guy. What's up, man? This is our What's second up? time around. This is our second time around, man. Yeah, <laughs> but we're going to keep that. We, we just, we're going to. Yeah, yeah the, okay. the first gonna, time. Yeah, first first, time, was first time was a mulligan. Let's make yeah, that okay. a mulligan. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How you been doing, bro? I'm doing good, man. I'm blessed, man. It's good to see you. Good to be here. I'm excited uh, to get, you know, obviously to sit down and talk with you and, um, you know, and chop it up, man, as always. Man, good. So let me start off by asking you, so where are you originally from? I'm originally from Elkhart, Indiana. Um, okay. It's uh, in the northern part of Indiana, about uh, 20 minutes from Notre Dame. Um, same place where that produced, you know, pretty well-known basketball player named Sean Kemp. And, you know, so, um, but, uh, you know, obviously we, we get a lot of great players out of there too. So, you were a freshman when Kemp was a senior, right? Yes, yes. But different high schools. Right. And uh, the funny thing is, Sean and I didn't know we were related to 2018 because both our families are from my dad's side and his um, mother's side are both from um, Tennessee. Covington. Okay. They're from Covington. We're from Milan, Tennessee. We found out we were cousins in 2018, but it didn't really matter. We always grew up like we were, you know, we were tight because of the basketball bond. So Okay. So just take me through your journey to Pasadena because you, you had a little yeah. bit of Pasadena and you was out there surfing, man. With the- no, I wasn't oh. surfing. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I wasn't doing. I was on a skateboard now. I was a skateboarder okay. early on, but okay. before I found my love for basketball, when I was uh, six years old, we moved to uh, Pasadena, California. My mother and uh, my brother and I, we moved. My mom was 22 years old, picked up, and I was six years old, picked up and moved to Pasadena. And we had family out there, and um, you know, we were out there. And my mom, you know, took a uh, a leap a, a leap of faith in trying to change the dynamics for you know her two young kids, and and uh, we were out there, and um, we enjoyed that. We enjoyed it a little bit. It was a great experience to to see a different part of the the world and, and, uh, you know, always being the new kid, uh, growing up, uh, in a different school system, you know, from being a Midwest kid to being a Cali kid was different. There was, you know, a lot of different things there. Cause even in the, you know, obviously, um, when I got there was the late, late seventies and, uh, the gangs had still started and, um, you know, there was recruitment going on and all those things. But, um, you know, we fortunately, uh, I moved from a basketball perspective and being able to be coach, we moved back to the to Indiana um, when I was in the fifth grade because of some some hard times that we went through and um, was able to, you know, continue my education and get better in basketball back in Elkhart. Okay. So now – I know this because we talk, but when people hear Pasadena, they think that's rich part of town. That's yeah, the, but I didn't live in a rich part of town. <laughs> I lived in the uh, I lived in the uh, the hood, you know. Okay. So, um, but at first, when I first got there, I went to I, I went to actually a school that you had to test into, and my test scores were so so high from coming from Indiana. Um, I tested into a very you know a very prominent um, school that was predominantly white. Uh, probably only four, four or five black kids in the whole school, whole elementary school. And, um, you know, got my first taste of, um, you know, sometimes why they don't like you. Um, interesting experience. I had to tell my mom after that school year, can I go to school with more kids that look like me? And, uh, I got more than what I asked for the next year. Cause the whole school was all, it was all black <laughs> and I fought every single day in school. <laughs> Gotta be careful what you ask. I gotta be careful. And this school was closer to where I was living at. Mm-hmm. And um but that dynamic too, you know, I tell people all the time, because we moved around so much and I was always the new kid, it actually helped mold me to where who I am today. Like I can walk into some place and I don't feel out of place. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Because you're okay. so used to you growing up, you used to being a new kid. And it is the same no different when I moved here to mm-hmm. Kansas City. Right. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't have any family here. I only knew one person here, and that was, you know, the person that I, you know, that that I was with, right. um, and that's the only person I knew. But it was all right. I, you know, I asked her. I said, "Hey, where's the gym at? Where they play basketball at?" And I said, "That's all I need to know." I said, "I can make a lot of friends through basketball." And right. you know what? Twelve years later, I'm still here in the great city of Kansas City, Missouri slash Kansas, you know, the metro area. So, 
Okay. So comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's what it, That's it, right. it helps yep. you become. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So let's just talk a little bit about um, your early life and how you got um, started in basketball. <laughs> you want the first story ever, basketball story? <laughs> yeah. Let's see, let's see. Uh, so like I said, I was predominantly – like I love to be a skateboarder. Like that was my thing. I was skateboarding in Indiana. Um, you know, I could do some tricks. This is before it even became like really popular. Um, and I never forget, I was on a playground in Pasadena and, um, you know, the playgrounds are wide open and I'm rolling around on my skateboard and the kids are over there playing basketball and I'm like, you know, nine years old. And so the kids are playing basketball and somebody has to leave. Somebody has to go home. And so the kids over there is like, Hey, come here. We need one. And I looked at him like, you talking to me? And so here's the start. Like the, the game is going on. I have no idea what's going on in the game. No idea. So you've never played before. I've never played or okay. organized game before in my life. Okay. I never played like, you know, I'm nine years old. I usually like, I like sports, you know, all of that. And, um, you know, so it's going back and forth. And I'm just kind of like hanging out at half court. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Offense, defense, and then we get a steal, the team that I'm on. And so they give me the ball. I paddle dribble down to the basket and do a jump stop and shoot it. It goes over the backboard. <laughs> and you know the fence that is behind the court? Yeah. It, it goes, bounces, it goes over that fence, and it rolls. And then if you know what kicking the curb is when the ball hits yeah. the curb and kicks yeah. it went all the way across the street. And, you know, classic kids, man, they like, man, you suck. <laughs> and I was like, y'all didn't ask me if I could play. Y'all asked me to play. I Like, I'm <laughs> technical with it, you know. And right. so, but that experience alone set off a fire in me. And it's the fire set off is to I really enjoyed the game. I I enjoyed all the what was going on in the game. And then I became like a, you know, I became like a sponge. Okay. And I started watching basketball on TV. And I was fortunate at one point we lived around the corner from Michael Cooper's mom. Oh. Michael Cooper, the great Laker. Man, and yes. so around the corner off of Los Robles, his, his his mom lived around there, and I remember seeing him. And then the Lakers were the first team that I got to watch okay. uh, because they were on TV all the time okay. and while we were in Pasadena. And it was during the time, you know, Magic was winning championships and all of that. So yeah. um, I remember I met a, bet, built a court in the back where we were at and uh, was playing my mom one-on-one. And um, – I did the high booty bump into her stomach. She smacked me in the back of the head and said, she said, you can't do that. And I was like, they do this on TV. And my, and my mom was like, well, you ain't on TV. And I told her, well, one day I will be on TV. And so um, that whole thing and then moving back to Indiana was a blessing um, because I got a lot of good coaching and I started to grow and started to really love the game more and understand all the nuances and uh, of, the bas of the basketball world. So, I got to talk just a little bit with you through um, Elkhart Memorial High School. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk a little bit about the influences during your time there mm -hmm. uh, and then how playing it. Because I've we've talked several times, and, and I heard you say before several times to where you didn't go more than one or two nights and not play a Division I uh, player that you played against mm -hmm. when you were playing there. And I heard you say that, Back then, it seated 8,000 people. Yes. So take me through, and that's in the high school. Yes. Yeah, so you're in Indiana, and a lot of people don't understand basketball in Indiana. They say New York's the Mecca, but if New York's the Mecca, basketball is, yeah. in Indiana is is a close second. Well, the you know, the start of my high school, uh, I can take you through from starting off when I got to high school. Um, I was – you know, about six four as a freshman, and um, I played freshman basketball the whole year, and I played some JV at the end. Um, we had a different varsity coach at the time, and I could practice. I practiced with the varsity all the time. I did really well. I didn't know. I thought maybe you know at the end of the day, and there's nothing wrong with this that I was going to end up going to 
maybe an NAIA school or I didn't even know if I was really good. I didn't know anything, you know. Yeah. Um, and so after my freshman year, we changed out high school coaches and the new coach came in and the new coach came in and wanted us to scrimmage. And he was coming from being an assistant at, at an NAIA school. So he brought these NAIA college players to scrimmage in the varsity, the JV, and whoever else wanted to, you know, see what was going on. So I'm I'm still 14 at the time, and and so we're scrimmaging, and I'm holding my own against the college players. And so the new coach calls me to the side, and he's got these two lists. He's got the list of the varsity and the JV, and he says, so what's your name? I said, my name is Damon. He said, uh, well, I don't see your name on either one of these lists. Did you flunk off? I was like, no. He's like, you didn't go out? I said, yeah, I went out. I was – I went out. He was like, did you get kicked off? I said, no. He's like, so what's your problem? <laughs> that was his question. I said, well, I'm 14, coach. And he was like, oh, you need to go to this camp. And I was, and then he said the camp's name, which is Five Star, and those that don't know that Five Star is the precursor to Nike and, and to all the camps now, Five Star was the, the camp that everybody went to, not just in – not just in a certain area, but everybody in the country. If yeah. you didn't go to Five Star back back then, and I'm dating myself, but that was the thing. So he gets me into Five Star in a developmental. He gets me. Well, he takes. He goes. We go home to. He wants to meet with my mother, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Dang, Coach want to meet my mom already." So we go, and I tell my mom, "Coach wants me to go to camp." Well, we don't have any money to go to camp. I was like, "I told him that." And then she said, well, what did you do wrong? I said, I didn't do nothing wrong. What's the meet? So coach comes over, and this is me. This is me to a T. He comes over, and he starts talking to my mom. The first thing he says, well, we think that Damon's going to be an integral part of the varsity. And I blanked out after that because I just wanted to play varsity basketball. That was it. Like, I was yeah. – that was the, that was my whole thing. Like, oh, I'm going to be on varsity. And he's, this man is saying it, and it's the spring and the season. I was, I, I was so elated. Then he was like, well, we think he should go to basketball camp. And then he told mom, like, hey, we can make sure you, get, you just get him there. And so I go to this camp. I go to five-star camp and and as a freshman, and um, they have about – 60 or 70 of the top sophomores to be in the country at the camp. You know, everybody from all over. And it's one of those primetime weeks of camp. They have all the top rising sophomores. And I go to this camp unknown. Nobody knows who I am. And I make the all-star team. I shoot all the way up the charts. And so now the whole I get back from the camp and I start getting letters from colleges offers and I'm like like I'm going crazy I'm, I got my shoe box you know we always had our yeah. shoe box right yeah. a shoe box of letters underneath I'm not telling my mom this my high school coach knows this I'm not even telling my my boys that I roll with I don't want anybody to know that I'm getting these college looks because I don't want to ruin the mojo right I don't want to ruin it and yeah. so my mom beats me to the mailbox so you know you start rushing to the mailbox all the time mom beats me to the mailbox she has these letters and um, she she comes in the house and she's yelling, and she was like, "Why are these like why are they, why you got all this stuff from these universities with your name on it?" And I go, "Oh, they want me to they I said, oh mom, they want me to go there.'" And she's like, "Really? UCLA wants you to come to their school?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, open it up." And she was like, before she as she was opening it up, she was like, "I just seen you play a year ago." Like, in a, she had got to a game. Her work schedule didn't get her to all the games. But she came to the game. She said, I just saw you play. You couldn't even walk and chew gum at the same time. I said, no, Mom, I've been practicing. And so she's like, okay. So she sits down. And we sit down at the table. And we talk about everything that went on at this camp. And uh, she wanted to know what was going on. And, like, this is about to be crazy. Because before I even played one varsity game, I had 70 offers. Which is yeah. crazy. Yeah, and that's crazy. So, so how I got, did you get to Michigan State? Well, I got to Michigan State um, because of, you know, I wanted to play in the Big Ten. That was one of the things. Um, um, but before that, I want to tell you about our high school gym because I'm oh, proud okay. of our high school gym, okay? okay? So our high school gym was the first big gym ever built in the 1950s. Okay. Elkhart, about that time, had about 40,000 people. But basketball was so crazy uh, in my hometown 
Um, they built an 8,200 seat facility. And while I was playing in high school, the smallest crowd I ever played in front of was 4,000 people. And that's because it was a blizzard outside. Wow. Okay. During a, we have the sectionals, which is like the districts and, mm-hmm. you know, region. During the, the sectionals, they scalp tickets outside. Do you have to people come to you, you see game. you see adults at lunchtime at my high school trying to pre buy tickets for the game so they don't have to stand in line you know our, we got four you know so it's a it's a heck of a spot uh, to play high school basketball it's you know we you know it's a it's a blessing that's why you want to get on the floor and be on varsity because you get to play in this you get to play in this atmosphere so when I got to college the atmosphere is never they never bothered me because I was used to playing. And, and when you play on a road in, in Indiana, there are some, some nice sized gyms, maybe 4,000 people, but they're, they're, they're the avid fans and it's packed to the tilt. They're yelling, they, you know, they're cussing, doing whatever and, and, um, and all that. So going to Michigan state, um, it was a big 10 school. Uh, I wanted to play in the big 10 as it chopped up. I got recruited by a lot of different people. Um, you know, I have a lot of family that was playing in that played in the Big Ten. You know, my father played at at Illinois and played he played football and basketball there. My uncle, my dad's brother, played at Northwestern, and then my uh, great uncle, Nebraska's in the Big Ten now, but he played at Nebraska, and we all were from um, you all we're all from Elkhart, Indiana. So, okay, I'm gonna just say a couple names, and then we're gonna move uh, a little further. But and then you tell me. Uh, about these names I'm gonna start off we already talked about Sean Kemp but I'm gonna start off with uh Big Dog Glenn Robinson Big Dog Big Dog that's my boy I never played an AAU game without Big Dog <laughs> okay. or Alan Henderson for that okay. uh, yeah you, so you've been looking at my notes no nah, no nah, because I know we all in the same <laughs> we all the same class and you know and uh yeah. it's funny and I and, and you know what all of us have really like reconnected and we've always been good friends over the years and uh glenn you know glenn and i we we used to practical joke each other and then al i used to practical joke al but we all were the same class i've known those guys since we were 14 years old okay what about lee nalon lee nalon lee is lee is from south bend indiana which is 20 minutes from elkar when lee was a freshman in high school he used to pop up at all my games and then so later on and life, and uh, you know, Lee is, is he, he is a great guy, and uh, he was an exceptional player too. And I was proud of him because I'm kind of his, I'm his OG, you know. Mm-hmm. And Lee was a pop up, and he said he try he was trying to learn because he was left handed, and I'm left handed, right. and so you know, Lee Lee had a great great high school career won a state championship which is not easy in indiana went on to lead college basketball and scoring and rebounding went to a had a nice little pro career too as Mm -hmm. as far as in the nba and uh he's doing well he's coaching now so uh, i'm proud i'm proud of i'm proud of lee okay one more name scott drew scott drew baylor's head coach so i know that i've known the drews for a long time too as well actually dana who is Scott's sister, um, class of 90, you know, Scott was class of 87. Um, and then Homer Drew, who's the father, uh, he was coaching, uh, locally at one of our, uh, in one of our colleges locally. And then Bryce was like in the eighth grade when I was a senior. So, and then before they moved uh, down to Valparaiso. So Scott Drew has come along, he's come along a long way. He's done remarkable things with the Baylor program. Now, one more thing, and then we'll transition a little, like, college and past. I got to ask you about um, – I heard this. I heard that – I think it was uh, – let me, let me I'll get my notes because I want to make sure I say it right. That the, the 1990 state championship game had 43,000 in attendance. It sold out like the Hoosier Dome. For a high school state championship game. Correct. Now, is that true? That's true. I was there. It was Bedford North Lawrence with Damon Bailey, who okay. was probably the most well-known high school player ever, you know, in the state of Indiana. Most well-known. Not right. he's not yeah, the best, yeah. but he's cool, though. You know, we, you know, Damon right. Bailey, is a, he was a blessing to the state against Concord, which is an Elkhart team, okay. our rival, one okay. of our, our rivals. So okay. our rival made it down there, and – they literally. This was the first year 
They moved it out of uh, Market Square Arena, which used to be the Pacers' home place. That's where we used to play the state championship. Okay. And they, this is the precursor that everybody doesn't realize, like with the NCAA tournament. We had 43,000. And then the next year they turned around and had 39,000 in the 91 finals because it was Glenn, Big Dog Robson, against Allen Henderson in the state championship game, which was which was probably one of the best marquee games you could have you could have seen. Man, wow. That, just to imagine those many people – uh, at a high school game, period. I don't care if it's a championship or mm -hmm. to imagine that many. You gotta, you gotta know how important basketball is to that community, those communities, because mm -hmm. they come out and see it. Because to have that many, that means families are coming. Oh yeah, you know, not just the 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 mother and father of the player, but you got uncles, aunts, grandparents, mm -hmm. the kids, the cousins. Yeah. Everybody's coming to see this game. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting how we used to do our tournament. It was it was no class basketball, meaning anybody could win a state championship. That's oh, what okay. that. So we started class basketball in 99, 98, 99. But um, but when no class basketball, that means the smallest school. Hence the movie Hoosiers. That was real. Okay. Milan, Milan, yeah. Milan, Indiana. They won a state championship because they beat Muncie Central. Okay. Yeah, but they people don't know this. They only have forty eight kids in their school in the total school in the total school Milan only had 40 wow. and people don't notice the year before they were in the final four wow that movie only concentrates on that them going movie. they think the journey yeah. but the year before they were good enough to get to the final four they lost to my uh my uncle was playing my great uncle was playing on South Bend Central and their top player Bobby Plump said oh we coming back next year and my uncle thought he was crazy because he was graduating and he was my uncle was graduating and Bobby Plump was a junior. He was like, coming back, do you know how hard it is to get here just to Final Four? And they came back and they ended up winning it. Wow. Okay. So Hoosiers is based on a true story. Hoosiers is a true story. Yep. Okay. So give me some or just give me a just give me one or two who you would say be the toughest players or opponents that you faced during your college career. College career? Yeah. Well, Glenn Robinson, uh, Garden Glenn, Grant Hill at Duke. Um, I have Vince Carter, um, Antoine Jameson, Ooh. Steve Nash. I got Michael Finley, Jalen Rose. Boy, you name it some. You name Artuas some. Kanishevis, who's now the president of basketball operations for really? uh, Chicago Bulls. But he was yeah. Euro Player of the Year, yeah. six nine. He had played in the Olympics the year before. He was playing for Seton Hall. Um, man, you you name it. You name it, so it was. Yeah. I used to go through the gambit, man. Every yeah. night, I never had a night off. Not I in the Big that. Ten or anywhere else. I see that. So, did you have aspirations, or do you want to play in the NBA? Well, I you know I really wanted to. My initial thing was to to play in college. And that was a dream to play in college. And once it got down to it, I mean, obviously, um, I had a remarkable, you know, high school career. I was, you know, one of the best in my class and to get to playing in the, one of the prestigious all-star games and, and going to the White House because of that, you know. So um, I thought that was always remarkable. A lot of people, I didn't even mention this, that, you know, when I was, when we were, when I was 10, we were homeless. You know, that's why we moved back from well, that's why we moved back from California to Indiana is because we were homeless for three months living in a mission. And then by the time I was 17, I was getting an opportunity to meet the president of the United States because I was a high school All-American. Like so that was phenomenal. But my, my it aspiration was <laughs> it was a journey. Yeah. And my you know, my aspirations, my senior year of college, it was like, you know, I was just enjoying myself in college, you know, and, um, you know, I had great college teammates who were pros, you know, Eric Snow, Percy Snow's yeah. brother here. So Eric Snow was my roommate, Sean Respert, who was national player of the year, you mm -hmm. know, Jamie Fike, you know, we, it was six NBA players on a roster while I was at Michigan state. And, um, but you know, Hey, I was in, fortunate enough to still carry on and, and still play six years, you know, overseas and still make, you know, I've never not had basketball in my life ever since I shot that ball over the top of the backboard. So, okay. so yeah, been very fortunate. Let's transition to now. Mm -hmm. What, 
Well, can you? No, I'm going to ask you, what inspired you to create World Vision Sports? Like, where did that come from? Well, World Vision, it started off as when I finished my, um, when I finished my playing career, uh, I went into coaching. Um, I was a college coach for three years, head coach of a junior college, uh, Ancilla College, and then I was assistant at Dayton and assistant at Green Bay. And then um, I got my itch to go back to the pro game, and I started a pro team. And when I started the pro team, um, the Elkhart Express, we were very fortunate, won two championships out of the three years. And out of that, I started taking my teams to China in 2007. And I took a team to China 2007 on a Goodwill trip. Um, then I ended up coaching the Shanghai Sharks from that Goodwill trip. I was able to do that. And then in 2008, we started commercial games how you see it now a lot of people say hey i'm going to china do this and this well we were at the forefront of that okay myself and coach lee chu ping who is now he's back with the sharks being the head coach um we started this whole whole thing with that and then when my um when my team when we had an economic downturn back in 08 09 the first one before like in the last one before when it really like when COVID hit and kind of crashed mm -hmm. everything in 08 09 um we started to play against other countries, national teams and all that. And so that transitioned me from doing that to the, then World Vision kind of picked off, you know, the my Elkhart Express was the precursor to World Vision. And in between that, I worked with the Utah Jazz as a scout. You know, I was covering the, uh, China for the first international scout in China. Um, so that transition to, to World Vision and what World Vision does today, and then we had to – you know, obviously with COVID, we had to kind of reshape and redirect what we needed to do from a uh, from a standpoint with COVID, and that's gotten us to where, you know, we are today. Okay. Now, this is a off-the-wall question. Stefan Marbury is over in China. Mm -hmm. Were you around that team or around with him being there? I was around when Stefan played his f at the first time. Okay. When he played the first time at um, – he was in uh, uh, Shanxi. We played Shanxi, and Stefan was there. And um, um, this is when they were trying to get his shoes and all of that. And, and um, you know, what probably wasn't – you know, you know, it was a learning experience for Steph, Stefan, too, before he went on to do great things with Beijing. And, you know, he's done a, a lot for basketball uh, in China. And, you know, he was coaching for a while, winning some championships – as a coach and he's you know he he's revered there and that's that's pretty that's that's a um you know that that's a a, a big task and a big mm -hmm. um compliment to him so okay so take me through the mission for and the vision for world vision sports um you know our mission uh with world vision sports is to um to connect um to connect different things as far as around the world. Like how do we connect? How do I how do I help the next generation get on, so to speak? Okay. okay. And it's from the sports standpoint. Right. Like if if I'm taking, you know, I've been to China forty eight times. I've taken over five hundred players, that's men and women. All right. There's been over four hundred pros out of those five hundred players. Mm. And we create a platform. We create a platform that most college coaches can't create. I know that for a fact. Most agents can't create because we can put, you know, we can put you on to play against a national team, which the game is going to be recorded. So now you can utilize this film. You can utilize this okay. film to go say, hey, look, I, I got busy against China. I got busy against Iran. You know, mm -hmm. I can play in that league. I can – those type of opportunities. Or, you know, I've had college coaches call me when I've got – you know, I've taken kids all the way down from eighth grade over, you know. Um, so that that's one aspect of it from the sports standpoint. And um, we look to dip into eSports because that's going to be a, a big-time international thing coming mm -hmm. up here. And lately, you know, we've dipped into, um, you know, our streaming – um, we thought that it was very important and how we transitioned out of that. And we transitioned out of the whole streaming thing started because of we were talking about esports. And when COVID hit and esports and and the musicians and the artists, they needed something to do because they were shut down. There may not be another world tour for somebody 
at a high level, you know, it may, mm-hmm. because we don't know what's about to happen, you yeah. know, so. So, I, I know you said you went over, but take me again through the connection um, with China through basketball. How'd you establish that? Well, in 2007, um, I had some uh, people that I knew in basketball, a guy that was, um, like, when I played, he was part of the um, uh, wealth management company that I was underneath. Now, did you play in China? I never played in China. Okay. I only coached in China. Okay, so that's what I'm trying. But this How is, did you this get is that precursor to this, to, okay. Uh, this. Okay, okay. This is 2007. I coached the 07, 08 season, but in in the summer of 07, they started asking. They was trying to get some people in China were trying to get American teams to come over. They were itching oh, okay. to do it. Gotcha. And just a goodwill tour. And so we started off. Um, it's a goodwill tour, but also this was it's kind of fueled by two because we had um I don't know if you know this, but at Purdue University they have these the young ladies that twirl the batons they call the silver twins. Mm-hmm. Well the silver twins to be were on our dance team for the Elkhart Express. And their father is Chinese. And he was um and so we I talked with him about going over to China, what we needed to do, all of that, and so we get four games put together. Um, we win a championship in our league, in the IBL. Mm. So we won two championships in the IBL. Then we go to China. And on this first trip, we take um, we take the mayor of my hometown at the time. Uh, we, take, um, uh, we take a city council person. We take media with us. And we're just we, – we play four games with no fans, no sell of tickets or anything. We're touring around. We're there for three weeks. But we have a huge sponsor. Um, we have a huge sponsor um, because I had met this. Um, we, I, I met this sponsor, and they sponsored all the buses and all the hotels and everything. Because okay. during that year, so it was uh, it was a, the number one bus company um, in China that made all the buses. The guy had, he was in Elkhart for business. He was looking at the Hummer plant. And he came to one of our Elkhart Express games, and he told me if I ever come to China that his company would sponsor everything for us. So we did everything we could to get it done uh, in, in the summer of 2007, and that that started off. So basically we went on a whim. Okay. And, and, it, and it just happened to play out, and um, we utilized some of those connections, and it, it uh, catapulted us into to being very successful. So how do you see the level of talent in China compared to other countries? Well, you know, China's basketball is is coming. They they've got a lot of players that you never uh you would never think. They got a lot of size. They have over about 300, maybe it might be up to 350 now as far as 7 footers. They have some big wow. big boys. Um I think that you know, their biggest thing is that their diet you know, everybody, you know, the comparative to the diet and being able to play basketball, um, you know, their diets are completely different. And and their ability, they can't play two games in a day. You know, their bodies will wear down, you know. Um, mm-hmm. it's not They're not built like, you know, when it's not like us, yeah. it's like not like us. Okay. Um, so it's, um, it's uh, but it's there a lot of talent. I think that what happened when Yao came over, the, the floodgates should have opened up even more. Because you only got a few players, and you get you don't get some of them to later on when they don't because the teams have them locked into these serious contracts. So okay, so what impact do you believe that your trips to China have had with the with the players involved? With my players, mm-hmm. um, I I think that you know some of our players have been very you know have been able to open up a lot of new doors for themselves. And the experience of playing overseas and playing internationally, uh, it opens up your mind to say, hey, I, either I need to work on my game, I need to, um, you know, I need to work on maybe even myself, you know, to being able to, hey, you know what, not everybody's going to play in the NBA, but there's a lot, there's still jobs overseas and seeing if you can cope overseas as well. So it, it's a it's an eye opening experience. Um, it's an eye opening experience for myself as well, because I get a different group of kids every time, and I and everybody you know they everybody's kids now because of you know hey where where our age is at now Mo you know so, um, mm-hmm. but I, I I say that with full respect, uh, these young adults and um, 
you know, I get to, to deal with so many different um, personalities and understanding backgrounds and, and just, uh, you know, trying to help uh, as many people as you possibly can. Now, how do you select the players and coaches that uh, go with you on those trips or those teams? Well, a lot of them have to do with um, friendships I've created as okay. far as the coaches. Mm -hmm. um, there's been coaches who want to go and get some experience, and I'm fully with you know with that because they want to go, they want to get the experience of coaching really good players. We get really good players, um, you know, people with NBA aspirations, people kids with college aspirations uh, as far as the players you know we've had um we've had different ways of getting players like you know if they're at the pro level g league level international level we utilize um relationships with agents uh brothers of some of the people that played for me in the past fathers that i know you know just different things and connections of of giving people a, a different opportunity and, and helping them, you know, put them on a platform that uh, we feel like they can handle and they can be successful with. Okay. So what would you say your your future goals are for World Vision Sport? Well, I think my, my future goals is to continue to expand. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that we can one day probably get a, a, um, a tournament here uh, in the U.S. on American soil. If not – uh, I want to see World Vision from a basketball standpoint expand out not only from basketball to maybe volleyball to soccer, track and field. Um, that's my, you know, grandiose idea. But I think that from a basketball perspective, I would love to actually do the world tour. And like we we've okay. played we've played over 25 different national teams and dealt with 25 different national FIBA federations. So we play in FIBA type games at the highest level. So some of these teams are going to go play in the Olympics. Those are the teams that I have to play against and coach okay. against. So I think that going to play them there in their countries and doing a three-game series where you go around the country and you play in a, against their national team in different cities, and I think that that is one of the best things that you can do and, and eye-opening experiences from just – Doing those types of um, doing those types of events. Give me one of your most memorable or proudest moments uh, with World Vision Sports so far today. Uh, Twenty eighteen, when we won the Eight Nations, award, we won the Eight Nations. Excuse me, we won the Eight Nations tournament, um, and in that tournament, we beat Nigeria in the finals. Mm. And Nigeria is an Olympic team, and then we lost in a pool play to Iran, who is an Olympic team. And we were able to jump out and, and play very well uh, with a lot of guys who had G League experience and aspirations. And that, that was one of the proudest moments that we got to that we got to that level because we had almost, you know, we had been pretty successful in this tournament. We had never won it though. Okay. And we've had some we had some really good good rosters and I think that even the best is yet to come. We've been able to put two different um you know, we have one documentary that went on Stadium Sports about what's life like for World Vision in China. And then, you know, we've still been working on our, our documentary movie that's finished. And, you know, we've been working on selling those rights to um, to a few different entities um, about that, about that whole 2018 experience. So, OK, so you said that. Basketball has been a part of your life since you shot the air ball over yeah. the goal, right? Yeah, I shot it out of bounds, Mo. Let's just be honest. Man. It wasn't air ball. Air ball, you can play an air ball. You can play an air ball. I said air ball over the goal. Over the goal. With, over with the, goal, the shot clock. Bounds, with, with the, the shot, shot clock out. violation. <laughs> with the shot clock violation. So explain to me how how you see basketball has impacted your life. You know, a lot of times people – Say it's a game, but with my experience in basketball and coaching, man, basketball affects your life. Mm -hmm. it, it really it affects who you become yep. and what you do a lot. So, t explain how you think it has affected you as a person and what you're doing there. I, I think basketball has been able to open up so many doors for me, and um, you know, we were having this conversation earlier um, about um, it's it's your vehicle. And I just had this conversation with, you know, some of, uh, you know, some of some of the young young people here at, uh, you know, at Jenga Club TV about mm -hmm. using your vehicle to go from A to B. What was your passion? What's your passion? Basketball was my passion. And a lot of doors open from that. 
Now, what you do when those doors open is completely up to you. Some may get shut down in your face, but that's fine. That's a that's a that's a speed bump. Um, and I think that what it's done is it's taught me so many different things um, as far as being on um, basketball, being able to to get it to this level and to be associated with so many, you know, people that, um, you know, have had a huge mark at, on the game of basketball. And, you know, you know, starting off is just somebody that, you know, all I wanted to do was play. And I still think that, you know, basketball is, it's, um, it, when they say ball is life, they, like mm-hmm. that, that is my, it's different. It's, it's different when you make it your life and you make it some, it's created some, uh, some really great, uh, friendships. It's created a lot of different, you know, avenues I can go into. And you know what? Hey, basketball is the reason why I'm here, you know, yeah. right now talking yeah. on, talking on, talking on your platform. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm here because of what, what I was, was able to do in the game of basketball couple more questions i know we're getting close to our time Mm -hmm. um but we were talking and and so i gotta ask you this how 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 are you or how have you started to bring music into your platforms and what Mm -hmm. you're doing well you know this all started like i I, I mentioned a little bit about during COVID, because with the esports um we were looking for artists that were the breaks of esports, the esport breaks, we were looking for like, okay, who would want to perform? We know artists out there, they you know, they they needed a platform um, because they were just there didn't have unreleased music. So out of that started like, hey, you know what? We need to I want to create an online global groove concert, which you know, the people that I was involved with that are involved with my uh, company, they had access to lots of artists. And we started to go down that path and figuring out how can we get the artists? What do we need to do from a streaming standpoint? How do we create our own streaming platform? And that streaming platform started to being able to create and how do we broker into uh, the huge market of the China, mainland China? Um, all those things started. But music is key. We, you know, we've got the studies done. We know that, you know, uh, Taylor Swift is big in China. You know, she's got six million followers. Most people out there don't know that there's TikTok and there's Dao Yin. This made by the same people. Dao Yin was the precursor to TikTok, but you'll never hear about Dao Yin. They're made by the same company because Dao Yin is only for mainland China with over a billion people. Wow. TikTok is made by ByteDance as well. It's for the American market. But Dao Yin is for the Chinese market. We know that over 700 million people um time this time warner time warner china has done it 700 million people buy online music content in china mm-hmm. and you look at it you break it down you go one you go say you go one percent of that that's seven million that's seven mm-hmm. million people buying your content you're still going to do pretty well if even if you went a half a percent that's 3.5 million right. people buying it so the sure numbers to do that and then globally you, you know, globally, you throw in there and we've, we've got some access to not only Africa, but also Europe and all of that. So, you know, once we're able to go live and do some things, we're going to be um, we'll be in a good place. OK. What is one thing that most people don't know about DB? One thing that people don't know about DB, I may be the greatest car rapper ever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Now, now outside the car, That's I was a struggle bus, struggle bus, okay. right? Inside the car, nah. I, I just think that um, um, what you see is what you get. I'm okay. pretty much in the same mood, you know, 99% of the time. Uh, and if I'm ever in a bad mood, that probably lasts about five minutes, okay. because I think I look at I look at it as on a on a bigger scale, and I know that not everybody. Um, everybody goes through things every day, you know, and yeah. not everybody's having the best day, right. and you know that. And so, um, I'm, you know, I'm a very, you know, you know, very, I get very tender hearted on, on people that, um, don't always have the, the best, um, situation going on, but are trying to fight to get out mm-hmm. because I, I was there once, you know, making the best of it, you know, so, gotcha. uh, yeah, so. 
Okay. That's me in a nutshell. Okay. Now, what is one thing that you want people to know about World Vision Sports? It's coming. Okay. We're coming. Now, tell people how they can get it. They can find you on social media. How do they get in contact with World Vision or with you? Well, you know I'm old, Mo, so I yeah. can't remember all my handles. <laughs> I think at. Now, don't say uh, that. Now, hold on. Queen Vine, gonna be, she going to use that against me again. Cause she, no, she's, well, actually, you know, don't say you're old. Say you're yeah. seasoned. There we go. We seasoned. Yeah. You know, we seasoned. It's like wine. That's, that's right. Yeah. We age like wine. Like, We're yeah. seasoned. Yeah. You know, you put a date on it. You're like, dang, that's a good date right yeah. there, you know. Um, the, the older the wine get, the more expensive it is. That's right. No yeah, doubt about there it. We go. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Um, on, um, you can find World Vision, uh, World Vision Hoops or World Vision Basketball on our YouTube channel. Um, there is WVSE.net, which is our website. Um, there will be um, when the two. Uh, Platforms are released. My two streaming platforms. One of them will be WV, WVSE.TV, and the other one will be WVCSEE, like you see, because uh -huh. uh, World Vision. Gotcha. Um, dot com, which would be more for the uh, China. Personally, my Instagram is at dbethea32, uh, B E A T H E A. Um, um, I'm on, you know, I'm on Facebook. We got a World Vision, uh, we got a World Vision Sports uh, page on um, Facebook. Okay. Uh, so okay. I don't, can't think of anything. Twitter, I'm at Damon Bethea. Okay. So okay, we got it. We know how to yeah. get in touch with you. Yeah. What message would you give, uh, or what message would you have rather for aspiring uh, athletes, the young leaders looking to make a difference uh, through sports? Well, I, I think that you have to hone your craft um, when you're aspiring to do something. You you have to be you have to be ready. You have to you, you have to be ready before you need to be ready. Okay. You know you can't just walk in and think that from day one it's going to be sweet. You have to you have to be prepared for the moment. Um, I think that a lot of and you know what if you're an aspiring athlete coming up. You might might want to dig into them books, okay? Because no matter what, how you get around it, you're not you're not avoiding college for at least one year. You gonna have you got to be academically right, and people don't understand this that you know what the scouts when they're about to invest millions of dollars in you, they they wonder how you are as a student because are you a student because it'll reflect to see if you're a student of the game. So if you're a student of the game, then the game is a lot easier. So. If you're aspiring, do your work. Do your work early. Do your work often. And don't don't let anything stop you from getting in the way of doing it, doing it the right way. Give me an example of an obstacle you had to overcome. Because what I don't want is I don't want our listeners and our youth to think that you, that everything was just always sunny for you everyone's had some obstacles and had to get through mm -hmm. so can you give me an example of an obstacle you had to get over well um i think early on um obstacle i had to get uh, over is that i wasn't as developed physically you know i was skinny okay. and you know hey you know what and my skills came later and i i sat the bench in the seventh grade Play one quarter. You know how they, they you have to be on the team, you got to play at least one quarter. Mm -hmm. I got that one quarter in. That was it. And I went to practicing between the seventh and eighth grade. Uh, that was an obstacle. And um, I got left off a prestigious team in Indiana, an all star team. And I didn't want to play after they asked me to play. And my mom told me that, you know what, you need to, um, you, you know, you need to still play. That's a prestigious honor. And I was, I was hurt, and I think that it it uh, it said a few things in college. You know what? I wasn't I wasn't always starting in college, you know. And it's yeah. You, know, you look around a locker room in college, everybody's average twenty five and ten. Yeah, everybody, you know, everybody's got the same credentials. You and you know those are obstacles. Um, you know I've you know obstacles. Um, you know just dealing with a lot of things, even in you know family. Um, mm -hmm. those are obstacles. There's a lot of things going on, 
um, that in and around you when you're a basketball player or when you're an athlete or in life. Same, no different. Like, you know, hey, um, but um, you just have to look at those obstacles and see them as teaching points or teaching moments in your life and you tackle them head on. Now, DB, do you cook? Oh, man, I'm a, I'm chef. Uh, I'm Chef Boy R D, but I use a different word in there sometimes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what what is what what do you cook? What is, what's your signature dish? I I have a lot and of different. Please don't say dish. toast. No, not toast. <laughs> so, I'm I can grill. Okay. I can make some greens. I can. Okay, I'm some. good on uh you know different chicken chicken breast. Um, you got spaghetti. You know, and I'm not talking. I'm talking about with some, with some good sauce. You know, not okay. just the ragu all the time. You spice okay. it up. You know, you know. I don't fool with nobody that don't have that black magic in they in they okay. uh, in that uh, okay. that black magic in that cabinet. For those of you who don't know what black magic is, that's Lowry's seasoning salt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I do a lot of different things, man. See, he was scratching his head. You trying to figure out what that was. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna learn today. You know? <laughs> you learn today. So now I gotta ask you. You said grill. That's the first thing you said. Now I'm, I'll just keep it real. Are you using the Traeger? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. That's all. Let's yeah. see if you're really grilling or not. You so know, if you listen, really went with the charcoal. You know where the best ribs? You know, look, Kansas City is known for the ribs, right? Barbecue, no, barbecue right? Uh -huh. You know where the best barbecue is? Man, I, I, first of all. Yeah. If you're not going to say Kansas City, then something. No, wrong. the best barbecue is off your grill in your backyard because when you taste it, you like, dang, this is good. You mm -hmm. think it's fire, don't you? Not always. I've not had, always. I've had, I've had a few people who put something on there, and I'm like, no, I'm talking about for you yourself good. personally. Everybody personally should believe that they oh, barbecue well, is the best, yeah. right? Everybody. That's should why believe I say it's the best out of best. your backyard. Okay, like, yeah, I, okay. You. I, I taste it whether it tastes bad or not. You're gonna be, you're gonna pump, pump yourself up, right? Nah, there. I, no, no, sir. If it ain't right, it ain't right. <laughs> DB, I ain't, DB, I didn't get this way for nothing, baby. <laughs> I didn't get this for nothing, I bro. I, if it ain't right, it ain't right. Hey, I tell people all the time, yeah. I don't know if I can give up, if I can give up pork, because that's how I got to be about six, eight, two fifty five okay. now. <laughs> so, okay, last last question. If you had the attention of the world for for twenty seconds. Mm -hmm. What would you feel that 20 seconds with? I don't want you to tell. I want you to actually just give me that 20 seconds. You got this platform going. You got both of them going. You got the attention because it's worldwide. You even got China. Mm -hmm. What are you going to feel that 20 seconds with? I'm going to feel the 20 seconds with not, not even a, a personal message, not even about what I got going on. It's what the world's got going on. And the number one thing is that we better – we're better than this. We're people. We're all the same. Doesn't matter how it breaks down. I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that's going on in this world that um, shouldn't be going on. But that whole thing, that message would be behind that. And that's one thing about, that's the great thing about sports. That there there is no, you know, the, the whole propaganda, what goes on between company, uh, between countries, governments and stuff, that has nothing to do with sports. Watch the Olympics. The Olympics is coming up right now. Y'all going to watch world leaders sit right next to each other and they countries hate each other. Mm -hmm. They will be sitting in row apart. They've talked all this junk about each other, but then they get in the same keyboard. They might be keyboard gangsters Yeah, in that aspect. But my message would be in those 20 seconds to, to figure out how we can do some, some better things globally and, 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 locally because if you do things globally they're gonna help nationally they're gonna help it's gonna it's gonna trickle down so now i'm sorry i i, I wasn't truthful <laughs> i would be remiss if i did not ask you this question i let you get out of here now you know just an hour is not long enough for me and you to yeah, talk i know it is so we're we gonna have to we, i gotta get this for a part two or three where part three yeah we gotta uh, just part, well, part one got uh, yeah part i'm gonna say part uh, one yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we ain't gonna even tell them about yeah, that yeah this part two i gotta get part three man you gotta give me greatest of all time basketball player who would you say is the greatest and then i want you to give me your top five 
In so any order, top five. You can give me top five in any order, but just but I want to know who you who you choose as the goat. Everybody, someone who's the goat. We know who they say, but who is the goat in your eyes? Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson's the goat. Okay. Magic Johnson. You know we got to ask why. I don't disagree. Magic, and I'm a saying, but why would you say that? Magic Johnson is the the most transformational player in the history of the basketball. It's not because he went to Michigan State. Well, that has to do. Oh, okay, and he, okay, and, okay, you okay. know, uh, <laughs> and, and he became my agent later on in life. So, okay. it, but so, but outside of that, uh-huh. you look at you look at Magic's body of work. Okay, by the time he retired, or was you know had to force retire because of what had he going on medically, at age thirty two, he had five NBA championships. He had been to the finals nine times. He didn't really have. He had one bad loss in the finals, and that was 84, okay? And that's because they played Bird. <laughs> in 89, they should have won the championship, and in 84, they should have won the championship. So think about this. Nine of 12 years before he came back afterwards, let's not count those years, even though they were with the Lakers. Nine out of 12 years, you're in the NBA finals. You're going up yeah. against – Dr. J, who at that time was the, you know, he was the he was the show. All right, you lose to when he came, you lose to Magic, you lose to Jordan in the finals. But that year coming back when he got hurt, the Lakers were revved up, ready to go. And that's the thing, like everybody, well, he had Kareem. Well, Kareem is forty two years old, who is also in my top five. Okay. At forty, at thirty eight years old, Kareem was the finals and MVP of MVP finals of the finals. So you got Magic, you got Kareem, you got Jordan, you got you got Bird, because Bird, uh, you have to respect you got to respect Bird's game. Yeah, as four, and um, you have to throw you got to throw in um, Wilt Chamberlain. Okay, just okay. because record books, I don't care. You try to go and score, I couldn't score a hundred points in a game against sixth graders. That's a lot of points. That's man. a lot of points. Yeah, a whole lot of points. And he averaged 50 yeah. for, you know, everybody gives him a – everybody gave him a, a bad a bad rep because he couldn't beat – he couldn't beat Bill Russell all the time, right? And everybody – Bill Russell, to, to, to go through the most uh, – to, to take it on the chin for everybody, for the whole, uh, you know, civil rights and all that, that's Bill Russell. You know, Bill Russell, he was bad in that aspect. And he was – you know what? He won 11 championships. Bill Russell was a bad dude. But as far as basketball players, that's I think that those right there. Then you got Kobe and LeBron um, in there in that top 10. And, you know, um, okay. you got some really good, you know, you got some other great great players. Hakeem Olajuwon, people don't know about Hakeem. When it came yeah, to dream, came to dream, it was yeah. some good players, really good players, really great players. Well, you rank Anthony Davis. Anthony, Anthony Davis. Oh. And, uh, did you say Miles Davis? Or are we talking oh, okay, jazz? Okay, oh, my I bad. Had to see what, I had to see what you was going to say. <laughs> Anthony Davis is a extreme. He's a he's a talent. You know, he's been a little injury prone. Um, is he? He's top seventy five all time, of course. Okay, Anthony Edwards. Ant Man has got a chance to this year. I think he's going to take off even more coming up in the NBA. Uh, I think he's going to be very successful. With this national team, you're going to see a lot of great things because he's playing. He's surrounded by great players. Yeah. You know, this national team coming up. And I'm excited to see Steph Curry on an Olympic team and Durant. And you, you yeah. think about all this. like, But I think Ant- Ant-Man, has he's got a chance to do some exceptional things coming up here. Okay. We'll talk again, my friend. Oh, well, yes, we will. I appreciate you for coming here, being a part of – uh, of our show today Give and taking your time Thank you so much uh, And this has been another episode Of the Evening Social Podcast Spotlight on Genefest Worldwide Radio Show Right here on 103.7 The Beat We out here